Okay, welcome back. This is the Metamorphic Site Productions podcast. I'm Hannah. Where am I? Oh, I'm here. Hi, I'm Will. Um, and this is the continuation of, actually, it's the final film we're going to be watching in our series about um, heaven experiences, people who claim to have uh, died and then went to heaven and then came back, um, also known as uh, near-death experiences, specifically Christian near-death experiences. Um, we did 90 Minutes in Heaven, and we did Heaven is for Real, and the final film we're going to do is Miracles from Heaven um, that was produced by Columbia Pictures. Um, I darn it, I didn't write down the year it came out. 2016. Ah, uh, uh, thank you. 2016, and it stars Jennifer Gardner and uh, Queen Latifah in a very minor role. Queen Latifah. Um, and I think that's oh, the doctor. He's like that Latin lover guy from that movie. I don't know, but there's two stars from The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. But I won't get into the characters because Hannah won't recognize them and. I don't know if anybody else in your listening audience even cares about Walking Dead anymore. Yeah, I didn't watch Walking Dead. So when he was like, oh, they're, he's from Walking Dead. Oh, she's from Walking Dead. I was like, oh, okay. But um, yeah, so we watched Miracles from Heaven. This is the story of the Beam family. And I want to say the little girl's name. Laser. Laser Beam. Ray Beam. The mother's name is Christy. Christy Beam. And the little girl's name is like Adeline or... I think Addie. Addie. Uh, sounds right. And this is a, once again, a true story about this little girl who was very sick. She had, um, basically her intestines didn't absorb food. It's a, like, it's a disease that, or a condition that can lead to your death. People do have it. It was like something about mobility, intestinal mobility. Motility. Motility, sorry. Um, and she couldn't, her body couldn't digest food. It would make her stomach distend and then she had to be fed through a tube and her mom was seeking like the best of the best treatment for her. She is not given really good, a good lookout into recovery. Um, and then while she is at home, she climbs this old tree with her sisters that's like rotten hollow in the inside and she ends up falling head first into the trunk of the tree. She crashes down to the floor, to the ground. It takes a couple hours for her to actually get out. They, the paramedics or the firefighters actually get her out. She, is, she wakes up. She doesn't have any like head injuries. She's not par paralyzed, nothing. And then like a week or two later after her recovery, um, her stomach is, goes back to normal. Um, she can eat food. She just doesn't have the issues she did before with her disease. And she tells her mom... Uh, yeah, Jesus said I'd be fine. <laughs> and her mom's like, wait, 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 what? And then she has to explain that when she was in the tree, she had a near-death experience or at least an experience where she went out of her body. And she, I think in the original, like I, I didn't do, um, I didn't, okay, I did. I did look up a video. I looked up a video with the interview of uh, the girl, the real girl. And I think she said she saw Jesus, like she actually did see him like Colton Burbo did. And he, she, he told her that when he, she woke up, there would, nothing would be wrong with her. She would be healed and that she would just go back to her normal life. Um, and then she was healed. Um, and so that, I want to say that happened in like 2006. I think that's when the, that was going on, 2005 maybe. Um, they wrote a book and then they made the movie in 2016. And so, yeah, that is the, that's a little sy plot synopsis of the movie we watched. And we're going to go through our questions and talk about it. Um, I, you went first last time, so I will go first this time. Mm -hmm. Sounds fair. Okay. So the first question is, what are the three things that you just want to point out right away? Uh, okay. <laughs> I actually wrote down four. Um, and then you can go ahead and comment on these two. I don't know if you've written these down. My first thing I wrote down was there's this part in this movie. So this movie, most of it is her being sick. I want to say 98% of the movie is her being sick. It's like the last five minutes of the movie actually is the falling in the tree. The last 20 minutes. We'll, we'll be fair. Last 20 minutes. Was her falling in the tree. But the majority of the, what, two hour movie? Was it two hours? Mm -hmm. Was her being sick in the hospital, being told she's not going to do well, having to go through a feeding tube. And then the mom having to deal with like trying to get her daughter treatment. They have a church. They have a family church they attend. And these ladies... Uh, okay, so the pastor does a sermon about 
in we would call it blessings and cursings. So uh, there's this idea. That's not an idea. It's in the Bible. But basically, if you um, try very hard to live righteously, um, it is known. It's it talked about in Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes that your life will probably be better if you live righteously. Like you won't. God will bless you more. But there's also that other side of the gospel that because we have righteous the righteousness of Jesus Christ um, and we're in the new covenant, God would never do anything to punish us. He would only discipline us. That You would say that is theologically correct. Yes, I would believe so. So it's like God is not punishing our sin ever because Christ took all of our punishment. He is, he would, when we, when believers go through hardship, God uses that to discipline us, to um, do a work in us that brings us closer to the nature of Christ and to prepare us for glory in the next life. Does that all sound right? I don't want to, I don't want to be heretical here. I'm, I believe so. Okay. He does a sermon about, oh, if you have something bad going on in your life, you should look to see, are you sinning anywhere? And you should, you know, go ahead and, and try to get closer back back to God and, and, and repent of your sin. Which, like I said, that is part of the message. That is true. But people can obviously take that the completely wrong way, which these ladies do. And they come up to this mother who might lose her child. <laughs> And is with a, a disease that is just completely out of her control, that she is trying to get help for her child. And they say, hey, she has not been healed yet. And so you should really think about looking into the sins of yourself, your family, and possibly your daughter in order for her to be healed. That was the most painful thing to watch. It was probably the worst scene in all of the three movies. Oh, you're shaking your head. No. What would you think was the worst scene? At the end of the movie, when the same woman stands back up after the girl was healed and the mom is like kind of sharing her story. And she's like, what if she wasn't actually sick? What if you're just doing this for publicity? And it just, it, I don't know. I don't know how true that was. I don't know how, if that actually happened or if that was like for the drama. But either way, it's it's pretty bad. It like made my stomach churn. It made me very angry because... It's because of instances like that, which are very real. They do happen in churches. There are people who believe that. It's a misconstrued, misinterpretation of the gospel. Um, but it also causes people to run away from the church and from God, which it causes the mother to do that. She refuses to go back to church after that. Um, and she's very angry at God. And she's like, I don't understand. Like, why am I being punished? Which she's not being punished. Um which we and eventually kind of get there, but not kind. It's not really explained that way. But that was my first thing I wrote down was that scene. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> so let's see. Oh, um, near death experiences, uh, out of body, talking without words. My little note I wrote down. So um, I was talking about near death experiences. I mentioned the book I've been reading by uh, Dr. Grayson. Um, after which he catalogs all these different uh, experiencers who have who've had near death experiences. And I said that Colton Burpo had um, specific parts of his story that was like uh, in in agreement with other near death experience uh, stories. And this girl, she also has she has the out of body experience where she said she could see her own body, which is other people said they have that has happened to them. Um, and then she said they could, she could talk to God without words, which is another thing that people say they, that has happened where they'll see some type of like spiritual being or they'll talk to something, but that's, there's no words actually spoken. It's more of like almost like a telepathic communication or spiritual communication. So that was really interesting. I wrote this down. I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting. She has these other things that we see from other people and other experiencers. Um, and then I... <laughs> I wrote, I'm going to, I'm going to save the funny one for last. I, I don't know if you wrote it down too, but um, we're going to talk about a big one. We're going to talk about in the filmmaking techniques is the pacing and editing. Uh, much like 90 minutes in heaven, it took forever to get to the point of the story. It was like, I don't know why that's a formula for these movies where it's like, we're just going to focus all of it on like the before part and then nothing of the actual heaven experience part. And then the last thing there's a scene, okay, so when the little girl falls into the tree, she has two sisters. She has an older sister and a younger sister. And they have uh, the policemen there, the firefighters are trying to get her out. And there's just all this, like, there's, like, a shot of the mother crying and holding on to her, her husband. And there's, like, the police are, like, we need to get her out of the tree. And the firefighters are, like, we're going to try this. We're going to try that. And then it just, 
cuts to the little sister with a little like gardening tool and she's like digging at the bottom of the base of the tree and she's like I'm gonna dig her out mom and the way it's edited is so funny and I both it took me and Will completely out and we were just like man oh it was we were just laughing and it completely took away from the uh emotion of the scene um and I thought it was it almost like Will said it almost felt like a dark comedy at that point um so yeah that was those are my things I wanted to write down right away and talk about so the I would say second most exciting thing out of all three of these movies first being Hayden Christensen was surprisingly in the first movie um Mr. Anakin Skywalker but out of nowhere in the beginning of this film contemporary Christian band third day pops up out of nowhere um and does one of their biggest hit songs in this church and it's it, they don't address them as third day they just mac and the gang or mac and the band and you know multi grammy winning dove award winning band that's been around for 20 plus years staple in the christian community um the, is is in this film makes it watchable because you're like oh are they going to come back and then they do like a montage later with them. It's like, oh, great, yay! Um, but my point was, I, and this is not facetious at all. The lyrics in their first song has more gospel-oriented message than this entire film, and that's pretty sad when a two-minute song clip has more of the gospel in it than this two-hour movie. Yeah. Um, so that was, I mean, yeah, that sounds funny, but it's also kind of sad because it's pretty hard when you leave it to a, you know, a mainstream band to, you know, take care of that when it's supposed to be a Christian film. Um, the second one is that my question, it's more of a point slash question. Does the fact that this is a kind of star studded film take away from the message or story? Um, I mean, does it take away from the seriousness slash um, importance, seriousness of the story? Because you got, you know, Oscar winning, Oscar nominated actresses or, you know, famous people that people have seen everywhere. Does it take the emphasis from the story and put it on, you know, the fact that, oh, these glamorous people are going to be performing or acting um it does that harm movies like this that was something i was kind of thinking about i'm like i'm more paying attention to all right who, who else is going to pop up in this because you start racking off names i'm like this seems nice but i'm kind of like who else is going to pop up in this film i'm not like okay i need to be more in invested in this story um and i think the last thing Something I kind of, I, to be honest, I forgot a third point, but I just came up with the third point before we started, was the depiction of the pastor. Um, it was very 50-50. So, like, the first, as soon as he gets done introducing or thanking, you know, third day, he starts his sermon, and it's, it's basically like a comedy show. I mean, he's pulling out hats, he's pulling out umbrellas, and the crowd is, you know, yucking it up, laughing, laughing. And he does, what, like a five-minute sermon and then says, bye, everybody. Um, and so that's all right, I guess. I mean, it does exist. There it are churches is, exactly like that. Right, right. And he does, he's not very great in the hospital either with the family. Um, oh, yeah. The Angry Birds part. Oh, yeah. He's sitting there playing Angry Birds. His, his... His, in all of intents and purposes, his flock is suffering. He is supposed to be attending to their needs, and he's sitting there talking Angry Birds with the little girls. Now, I get it. He's he's trying to keep the little girls occupied, but it feels so out of touch. It feels like he he just got his pastoral degree the night before, and he actually just didn't study for anything. He just kind of goofing around now. When she comes back to the church, the mom comes back to the church and he's like, hey, I heard what those women said to you. Your your husband said this. He he does do a pretty good job of, you know, addressing that. And it's like, hey, they're wrong. 
that's not what they're supposed to be doing and that and actually you left not because of that um which is good he he kind of was he used discernment there but he wasn't there was barely any gospel anything coming out of his mouth and so i was like wishy-washy i'm like he's pretty good with people but that's not his main job um it's not his main job to be good with people i mean leave that to a uh entertainer on a cruise ship he he barely said anything about the gospel so those are my three yeah okay so talking about the before we move on i want to say remember i thought the pastor was todd packer from the office and you're like no he's from walking dead what uh character do you play in walking dead to try to, to try to stay away from details um there's a, a moment where there's a character who's kind of lost his mind over the the impact and stress of the the loss of his family as well as the whole like zombie apocalypse and he meets this guy who plays the pastor in this movie and the guy mentors him on how to deal with his trauma and his heartbreak but also teaches him how to kind of hone and like focus his stress into fighting but also no longer taking lives so he was going on like this trek of like killing anything he saw whether it be a zombie or human and this guy talks to him about the sanctity of life and protecting and preserving life um and so he's a really he's only in one episode but i really like his character because it's he kind of brings some humanity back to the show do you think that hold on I just want to make sure my levels are okay I think I know what your question is and yes he played the part in The Walking Dead way better <laughs> and almost more Christian like than he plays the pastor in this movie um, well kind of my question uh, related do you think that the people who made this movie were like this guy in The Walking Dead like maybe he auditioned maybe like his agent knew the people who were making the movie and they were like oh yeah like he plays that character on that episode and that's that's what we want for this movie and he kind of didn't and that might not that is probably not the actor's fault because obviously he can play that it's probably the director's fault at that point of you know he, an actor is given direction and given material and that's what they have to do but it's interesting that you already saw him play a character that is pastoral in a way in a way that was i don't know if you would say that character would be pastoral in that way shepherding but maybe not yeah he was almost uh if he had christian qualities but without calling himself a christian yeah okay so the qu- second question what did you like about the filmmaking techniques used um oh sorry not what did what didn't you like what did you not like about the filmmaking te- filmmaking techniques used Okay, so I uh, the the number one thing was the editing. So we we actually together were like we came up with a way they could have edited this movie that would have made it feel much more succinct and together and it was very simple. So in the beginning of the movie we just get a narration voiceover from the mom and the mom talks about miracles and she's like, What is a miracle? Like and she kinda goes into the definition of a miracle. And it's just establishing shots of the family farm and like shots around of like the cows and the chickens and things like that. What I think they should have done is they should have ha- like when we ta- said about this, we sh- they should have had a preview of the accident of the little girl falling into the tree. And that would have led into like basically like a like a time jump so it would have been the beginning it would have been the girl falling into the tree and then it would have um maybe had like a title card being like you know a year earlier or whatever um to explain that this was before that that you know this was a time jump in the a time flash forward that's what it's called a flash forward like a flashback they would do a flash forward in the beginning of the accident then it would lead right into the mother's uh, voiceover about miracles and things like that. And the reason why is because at that point, the audience now knows, okay, at some point, the little girl is going to fall headfirst into this tree. And I don't know how that even connects to the story at all. Because it's like, okay. And then and then she starts going on about the, her being sick with the stomach and everything like that. But we know, we would know at that point, the tree is involved. There's an accident that happens like, that would be in our minds the whole time. And then when it actually happens, everything would kind of be wrapped up. 
they do not have that. That's a suggestion that we came up with. That's something that, that if I was editing this film, I would probably have done. Yeah, I was just reading my notes. It's just that I, I felt like it would have helped exponentially with the pacing of the film. It would have helped like close all of the, the ends the, together and made it so much more streamlined and, streamlined and cohesive. And we would have had you know, much more of a, a focus on the actual experience of the little girl going and seeing God because we would know that something happened with that tree and then something connected with her sickness and with her illness. And then at the end, when it's revealed that she was healed, that would have been a much more well-rounded way of doing things. My second part for this is uh, Queen Latifah seemed really random. It was kind of nice. She had a nice character, but she just seemed like she was out of, she came out of nowhere. We were just sitting there and Queen Latifah showed up and I was like, okay. And she was only in the movie for a collective of like 10 minutes, maybe, maybe less. Um, and then I wrote, there's a strict formula to these films, which I finally have found after watching about three. I don't know if there's any more films about people who went to heaven. Um, I, these are the three big ones that I know about. Um, but they all have the same formula and the same like outline. And so it it goes with, it starts with like a church. They always have a church community that they are a part of. The family is a part of, there's a medical emergency. There's a lot of drama in a hospital, uh, and money that's connected together. There's the heaven experience is revealed, and then there's a church sermon about the experience, and then there's deniers or acceptors. And then the movie is normally not about the actual person who experienced whatever they're going through. 90 minutes in heaven was a little different about this, but it's really like about a person that's like outside of the experience. It's like trying to figure out this loved one's experience and why they're different. And it's not so much about the actual person who had the experience. So um, those are my my things that I said that I did not like about the filmmaking techniques used. Um, and I don't know if the last one was really I did not like it. It was just a, a, a observation I, I saw. Um, so what, what were some things you did not like that they did? Um, spacing definitely for me. I they a lot of the scenes in the hospital and with Queen Latifah and you know trying to maintain some normalcy in their family were were. I get it. They were important, but also felt like they were stretching things out a lot. Like I really didn't need to see the fact that the dad came home and he had been working. Uh, he had made it clear earlier, working two jobs, extra hours. Um, and then he comes home to say hi to his daughter and his daughter, you know, gets all angry at him and huffs off to bed. And I'm like, there's no need to show that except that you're just showing tension at home. Because first off, it was already made clear that he was going to be working hard. Um, but then right after that, right after that, they're like, oh, now we're going to put everyone on a plane and head up to see the mom in Boston and they're in Texas. So it goes from she's upset and she's struggling and the dad's struggling to, okay, everybody, let's get on a plane and go it kind of felt uh it felt like it was padding in the runtime um plus we spent an hour and a half just the same story and there wasn't hardly any mention of heaven or you know miracles it was just building up the tension building up the the i wouldn't say the suspense i guess the the direness of the situation so that the miracle when it came was even more powerful. Um, and I think the other part of it is kind of tied to this is that I felt that the finale felt rushed and unfulfilling. We get to the end. We get to finally know about heaven and how she sees heaven. And it's the last 20 to 15 to 20 minutes of the movie. Um, and they have the whole, you know, they get the, they, the girl is in the tree for like five minutes. She gets to the hospital. The doctor comes out. He's like, I've never seen this before. Uh, she's She fell on a tree and hit her head, and she was completely fine. Um, and everyone's like, oh, wow. And then she's she casually mentions heaven to her family. They're like, oh, wow. And she's like really nonchalant about it. Then it cuts to them in the church. She's giving her little, you know, the, the media is all there watching. And then it cuts to the family having pizza, and then it's done. 
and it's <laughs> it's super family having pizza. It's super rushed, and it, it doesn't. There's no hey, let's talk about you know the fact that your daughter said she went to heaven, or you know the impact that this is having on your daughter who spent so much time in pain and agony, and now she's freed from that pain and agony, and she's just like shrugs her shoulders and moves on with her life and i'm like there's no gravity to that at all and it made me observe something too at least actually for all three of these movies nobody's like super psyched that they went to heaven nobody is like really happy really elated really pumped really like worshipful or you know in a moment of like ecstasy or like wanting to like excited like telling their parents telling their loved one i went to heaven this is what it was like yay it's like the two children were very meh about it like ah totally went to heaven talked with jesus talked with other relatives people that don't exist in this reality saw another plane of existence kind of meh and then we get to Don Piper for the first movie, 90 Minutes in Heaven, and he's like very depressed because of heaven. He's not, there's no, there was no like joy on his face and then like anything else. He wasn't even joyful at the end of the movie when he has to, he has to talk about it. He was just kind of, there was, there was no enthusiasm about heaven. Heaven feels like the DMV. It's like, I have to go there, I'm going there. I'm going to probably tell you how my experience was being there, and that's it. I will say, in defense of, because in the reality of it, I, going through my research, a lot of people who have near death experiences or experiences like they they see Jesus, they go to heaven. A lot of them are afraid to talk about it with other people because they're very afraid of being called crazy. And they're very afraid of people just like not understanding. Um, And that's common that except for, um, well, okay. So the two children, I guess children may be different. So Colton is like four when this happens, he's a little boy and he just says stuff like he just randomly says, Oh, this happened. And I'm like, that's kind of expected for a little boy that, that age. I don't know how old she is when this happens. I want to say she's like eight. She eight years old, eight or nine, I think. And she has the whole thing where she doesn't tell her parents right away, which is more common for near death experiencers, where they have this they have this experience, and they they know that no one's really going to be able to uh, not explain it, but to um, like believe it or to accept it. And so they don't really talk about it. And that's the same thing with Don Piper. His friend is the one that was like, the next person you tell, if they say, tell me more, you need to go out and like tell the world about it. And at the interview I actually saw with Don Piper, he said, I wrote the book because I wanted people to stop asking me about it, um, which is like, he still has to go and talk about it. But that is common for people who go through this, where they just like, it's so out of the box. It's so out of what people are, know in their reality and they through the their knowledge of other people they just are like I don't think anyone's gonna believe me or they're gonna be very non-understanding or non-welcoming to that and so they just kind of not talk about it um but I mean for the f- sake of like the film and for the sake uh, there could be much more time given to like the after the experience part we only get like this little wrap up in each one where it's like they have the experience. They finally tell somebody and it's like the last 20 minutes of them. Like they have a church service where they, the person gets up and they speak and they talk about it and that's it. And there's not a lot else going into the whole point of the experience of heaven in this movie. Literally the mom has like a little sermon. I don't know if it's a sermon. She just gets up and, it wouldn't be a sermon. She just kind of, she she says some platitudes about miracles. Some of it I did like. I'll get to that later. But a lot of it is like faith, faith, and and I kept saying faith in what? What are we having faith in? But it was very much like just faith. 
Um, and then that lady like yells at her and then, yeah, but I do agree that that part of the, the meaning and of, of what we can learn and gather from it could be expanded much more in these films. Okay. So then we have, what did you like about the filmmaking techniques used? I said, I, I like this one the most out of all the three ones we watched. I like this one the most, even more than 90 minutes in heaven. Um, 90 minutes in heaven was too sad and um, I want to say soggy. <laughs> it, it was a weird way to describe it, but it felt very, um, oh, sluggish. That's what it was. It was too sluggish for me. This movie had some umph to it. Um, it definitely needed work, like I said, with the editing and like keeping the story like all together in like going on the same track to the same point. But um, I did enjoy it. I, I, I don't know if it's because I, I identify a lot with a little girl. We like she reminds me so much of me when I was little. She loves mermaids. <laughs> she loves pink. She's like I like I get it. I get it. Um, and actually the whole she loves mermaids thing. Um, they did this motif throughout the movie where they put uh, marine life. So whenever like she goes to like a, a doctor's office, a pediatrician's office and there's like fish that are like up on the. Um, ceiling like little statue or, or they go to the aquarium and they or she's wearing like a sea a seahorse like t-shirt and they always keep this motif of like marine life mermaids um, and it kind of helps us get the I believe the audience get into this, the world of this little girl it's kind of getting us to look at this experience of being very sick and not knowing what's going to happen through the eyes of this child and her personality and her, like her personal like world um, and I liked that. I think that was, it was a nice touch. Um, they had bright colors. I think that's appropriate for the subject matter. I think that the, uh, like I said, 90 minutes in heaven had that very serious, very grayscale almost cinematography. Um, this one was much different, much more like uh, heaven is for real in that way. And then I said the acting was good and not distracting. Uh, there wasn't anything really in the movie that was like distracting that was like, oh, this is uh, this is a weird direction, or the acting is not up to snuff. I know that we had a we had kind of a problem uh, with the Heaven Is for Real one because of the little boy actor, um, but yeah, I thought the acting was actually very good. And then I wrote the girl actor the so I don't know who she is, I don't know have her name, but the actress or actor who portrayed the main girl the main um, character, she was very, very good. She was a very skilled actress for her age. Like she carried the movie. She was the one that was, she had the, she had the most pull in the movie. And you would think that would be Jennifer Gardner. That would be Christy Beam, the mom. Like Jen, And Jennifer Gardner does great. Like she's Jennifer Gardner. She's a professional actress. She's, I don't know if she's considered A-list, but she is, you know, very well respected and known. Um, and she's really the only big, big name in this movie. Um, but she is helped tremendously by the skills of the little girl she works with. Because it's really their relationship is the center of the movie. And they do a very good job at showing that that pain and that love and that. And, and you really feel for this mother-daughter team that they are going through this such a difficult, difficult time. And um, I think I thought that the that the the child actress really just blossomed and bloomed in her role. I was very um, impressed with her. I would agree. I, I felt like just for a little nod to what you said, I thought it was pretty good the relationship that they they built off of, but at the same time they had one opportunity to have tension and there was a moment where the the little girl kinda like it has a moment where she's like, I want to die. I don't want to be here anymore. I'm tired of this. And she kind of fights with the mother. And I'm like, okay, are we going to deal with this? How is the mom going to buy this? How's the mom going to face this? Nope, there's no real dealing with this because the dad and the two sisters burst in for a surprise visit and there's no real consequences or discussion or prayer or anything about it. Just like they apologize because people are there to be there. So I felt like that was a little bit of a, a missed opportunity. Um, the one thing I liked was that I felt like the representation of light was beautiful and executed well. I thought there were moments where it was like the brighter rooms made it so that the there was hope i don't know i felt i don't know how to describe this properly but the use of brighter colors and bright lights kind of brought in the element of hope 
And then you started seeing like darker rooms were used when things were hard or diagnoses were rough or they were having a hard time, something like that. I think those are all solid points. I think that the cinematography, I don't know, I, I need to look up who the cinematographer was, um, but I think that it was more purposefully done than Evan is for real. I don't know if you agree with that or not. I would, I would agree. Yeah. And I feel like 90 Minutes in Heaven was very stylistic. They were like, we want this style throughout the whole film. And it wasn't so much story motivated. Um, I mean, I understand that like they showed Earth as like more gray and kind of, like I said, has kind of like a soggy feel. Um, and then Heaven was very bright and the contrast to it. But we already talked about that in that podcast. But um, yeah, I felt like the cinematography in this one was very possibly story motivated and definitely in some scenes. Um, and like I said, it was pleasant to watch. It was very nice. Okay. So what did they get wrong in the message of the film? Okay, so really we're talking about at this point that wrap up service sermon speech that they do that Jennifer Gardner gives. This is what I mostly focused on. She says, miracles are God and God is forgiveness. And I think you have that written down too. So we're both going to say something on this. So it, the film barely mentions God or Jesus. Um, they fa- they vaguely talk about faith and they don't really specify faith in what. They're just like, have faith. Keep your faith. And I'm like, okay, what are you having faith in? The dad. So there is a part in the movie where Anna is in her room and she has a roommate. And the roommate has cancer. And I think her name was Haley. She's a little girl. She, Anna starts telling her about the faith that she has because of her belief in Jesus. So she says, I think I, I might die from this. It scares me sometimes, but I know that God is always with me. And tells that to Haley. And Haley is really receptive to it. And she ends up believing, I I believe, in Jesus at that point. And it's a very simple, like, probably faith at that point she's a little girl all she knows is that jesus loves her I, but it's revealed later that the um her father comes to that that speech that the mother gives reveals that Haley passed away from her cancer but that she had this new faith before she did that is a great part of this movie it shows how such a little instance of sharing your faith and sharing the gospel and sharing Jesus with people what what a what a ripple effect it can have how God can use it I thought that that was a great aspect of the film and that it was very good and they did get that correct I thought that that was a good aspect of the film that was very hopeful but when the father is saying this like when he's telling he, he comes to the the speech that Christy Beam is giving and he stands up and he says hey my daughter was a believer but she died um, and he says that Anna gave his daughter peace in a way like I understand that he could be meaning that like through her sharing the gospel, she gave peace to Haley. But it would have been more accurate to say that Christ gave her peace, that her faith in Christ gave her peace. But I did say, OK, this guy could not be a believer yet or he's a baby believer, which he's getting this part wrong. And I'm like, I mean, that does happen. Like people who are just new to the faith, they don't get intricate details cr- uh, completely correct all the time. So I was like, eh. but in the movie, it did it did come off very strongly that it was like oh it was Anna who like did the good thing and not Christ um which is a problem oh and then big one big one right here um Christy uh in the middle of the movie before the healing the pastor comes and talks to her about why she hasn't been coming back to church and she asks him the problem of evil she says if God is good and loving why is my daughter suffering why is she in pain why is she why is he letting her be in pain and the pastor doesn't have an answer for this he doesn't have a theological answer for the problem of pain or evil um and I felt like that was that was problematic that was something they specifically showed in the movie and they did not answer it they just had her question and didn't have a good theological answer for that conundrum and i was like come on guys if we're this is a christian movie we could be doing better so i'm not going to mention the miracles are god god is forgiveness because that doesn't make a lot of sense also i didn't really know what she meant by god is forgiveness like why was what, what was god forgiving she never really admitted she committed sin or there was any sin so it kind of made it almost almost like those women are right. She didn't want to admit it. It kind of felt weird. Um, I, I said faith um, is made into a flippant, meaningless term. It just kind of thrown around like if I said sausage and just like go eat sausage. I love sausage. It, it, what I mean by that is that it's just another word. It's just another word that everybody kind of semi understands. 
but nobody really asks a lot about. Just like sausage. You just kind of understand, but you don't ask a lot of questions about. Um, but also, this is my big, big letter home from the from this movie. Faith is a publicly accepted word. Everybody hears about faith. You know, country music stars use the word faith. You know, one of them is named Faith Hill. Um, faith is just a, it's a fun word that people who believe in Christ or don't believe in Christ use flippantly generically um you know i'm sure if i were to turn on a hallmark channel i would hear faith a few times before the end of the night um but words like salvation christ heaven uh, like eternal life uh sin things like that those are not publicly accepted so they are almost either non-existent in this film or like quickly said and moved on um and so that made it so any power that the fa- word faith should have is completely ripped away. And it's now just a believe in yourself, believe your way through the situation, you know, grin and bear it. You've got this. And that's pretty much it with like God being semi the cheerleader behind it. That's really, it, it's again, just like um, heaven is for real. It's like a, a nice warm family film with like slight dashings of, of Christianity in there to kind of appease both parties. Cause they, they, I guess the movie people don't think that a, a Christianish movie would uh, survive in theaters. So they're going to put it as a family friendly film with like sprinklings of Christian words, Christianese words, but without the Christian oomph that should be there this film felt very culturally Christian in the way of like when people associate American family values with Christian values, even more so than heaven is for real. I guess it's because they own a farm and they're from Texas and they have that kind of that, you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) The yeehaw, you know, God and America, God and America are just like tied together at the hip. God guns, Ford trucks, barbecue, steak, steak, um billy ray cyrus um trying to think of other things fishing uh professional wrestling professional football it's like the the synonyms of americanese family values and whatever is acceptable version of christianity that could be dashed into this film Okay, so our last question, uh what did they get right in the message of the film? I already talked about the uh conversion the of the little girl who had cancer and I like that aspect. I think that was a very simple little tidbit in the back of the story, but it was a very like st- standard straightforward, hey, if you share your faith, if you share the gospel, if you share the truth, you can change or not you. God can use you to change people's hearts and, you know, they can enter into salvation with Jesus Christ. So that I did enjoy that part. I wrote down, uh, I said, I really liked the vision. I liked the vision of um, God slash uh, the intermediate heaven. I liked her waking up and kind of going through the, the meadow and the field and being in the trees and seeing the flowers and the light. Um, I thought it was very beautiful. It was very dreamlike, but also just sweet. And I, I enjoyed that. It was very... I thought it was very artfully done as com- as compared to like a 90 minutes in heaven. Um, heaven is for real kind of did that too. I felt like this was much more pretty in the way of like showing just beautiful imagery to give the, the idea visually that God's presence, God's presence is everywhere, but this was like God's presence is there you are near God's goodness and his holiness and his glory. I like, I liked how they did that and they showed all the beauty and the flowers and the colors and the light. Like you said, the use of light. I enjoyed that. Um, then there's one part in the speech. Like I said, the wrap up speech they have to give at the end. She, Don Piper's wrap up speech, short to the point, completely pointless, but concise. You all prayed. I'm and now I'm here. And that's that's it, but it had nothing to do with gospel. Go ahead. Sorry. I just noticed this is the second movie that was they were from Texas. She says something in her speech where she says that, how do we define a miracle? And 
she makes this quote from Einstein that says, either you can live your life like nothing's a miracle or that everything is a miracle. And they start showing things that happened in the story that she now sees as miraculous, which is like at one point, um, at one point the, uh, there was a guy that the, her family is trying to go get on a flight to go see her and the, and the little girl, Anna, and they are running out of money because of all the hospital bills and everything they were doing. And they're just trying to get this flight to go up there and their credit card is being declined. And the guy who is handling their, their flight tickets realizes that this is like a dire situation. And he has a problem. I'm putting air quotes up with his computer. Um, And he's like, Oh, I guess I'll have to manually issue your tickets. But really he helps them get on this flight so they can go and see their, uh, their daughter and their sister. And that was mentioned as like like a miracle, which is this man's kindness of, of helping these people. And then Queen Latifah's character, who is this friend they make in Boston, who helps them um, and gives them a little tour of the city and is just kind of like a uh, friend in this time of need, is considered a miracle. Um, and then the girl, the, the woman who works, so the mother is trying to get her daughter into this special pediatrician and the mother um, talks to this lady who is a receptionist. And she says, my daughter, I've been trying to get her in here. We're on a wait list. And she just tells her, like, I really need help. And the receptionist actually um, does go and talk to the doctor and says, hey, like, this is case I think you need to look at. And she's considered a miracle. And that part, I'm like, yes. In a way that God uses people. God definitely uses our faithfulness. God definitely uses us being kind and generous and loving to everyone um, to work out like miraculous things in people's lives. And so I like that point. I was like, okay, yeah, I think that gives so much incentive for us to be even more living like Christ day to day. Now, these people, were, I don't know if they were Christians, it's never confirmed or denied that they're Christians in the story, but it's just showing that living out living out a life that is glorifying to god and and um, a life that is full of you know righteousness and kindness and love and that is indeed miraculous and it is indeed something that god that brings him glory and brings him um joy and brings him um how what's the word I'm looking for? I guess, yeah, it brings some glory. It, that, that, that's something that brings God glory. And that's when we can, we as Christians can definitely shine by, by living that way. And God can make miraculous things happen through us in that way. Sorry, that took so long to say because I was distracted. <laughs> that's all right. Um, I guess my one positive thing from the message is that the influence of Christ and his followers can, not saying exactly it was, imp- like it was exemplified in this film, but can bring hope to a, a dying and sick world. Um, they give like little glimmers that Christians can make a difference, but for the most part, it's the Christians that let her down. Um, I mean, her husband says he's already doubting his faith. Uh, the pastor doesn't have answers for her. Her church body is questioning her like legitimacy of the the incident at all um and so she's 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 seen praying a few times but i I guess if you're willing to really like dig in just a little bit you can kind of get the message that you know god and his followers and his people can help guide people to hope in times of crisis but overall like if if you were to take the church out of this like literally the physical church m- scenes and remove them from this film, there would be almost zero connection to God at all. And, and it would be, uh, and you wouldn't really know it's a Christian film. The only reason you know it's a Christian film is that it's got third day in it and it takes place in a church. And once again, I will reiterate this. If you go and see this film, third day has the most gospel centered uh, message that this entire film will present to you and it's in a song that has, was on the radio for several years so just saying if you really want to just you know skip the movie just listen to the song what was your initial reaction when you started hearing the song you're like oh and then you saw that they were in the movie what was the first thing that was like 
the initial reaction was like, oh, great. They, they were able to get licensing to use contemporary Christian music. Okay, that's that's fine. But then, oh, it's legitimately... I'm not a big fan of contemporary Christian music. I feel like sometimes it's real hokey and real cheesy and like devoid of most, not only messages that are deep, but also like relevant application problems and situations that apply to our, our actual individual lives that people deal with emotional trauma, physical trauma, struggles spiritually. And, you know, sing songs about water and flowers don't really do anything, but third day consistently since i was a little kid has been really good about the gospel but also a unique christian contemporary band with like a country rock twist and his the lead singer's voice mac powell is phenomenal it's real fun it's real good so getting to see them i'm like great i could shut off the movie now and i would have gotten (laughs) way more value than sitting through the two hours and really having to like strain my eyes a little bit but i'm glad they put them in there i'm i'm glad i got to see them uh i have a, the utmost respect for the band um but i also felt like and our pastor said this on sunday why were they even in there you know i mean i doubt it was for a paycheck i think it was because they they either believed this girl's story or wanted to support this girl's story but they were the best representation of christ in this film and they were on the screen for two minutes so they have a song about miracles and they didn't play it. They didn't use it. <laughs> they didn't use it. I was like, well, this opportunity. I don't know why they didn't put that in there, but they did have that song collide in here. I was like, is this a Christian song that you and I collide? Do, 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 do. They have that in the middle of the movie. And I'm like, is this what? I'm like, when I'm walking in a Walgreens right now, like shopping for toothpaste. <laughs> um, another thing, like I, did you feel that Jennifer Gardner was like supreme, like hallmark slash lifetime female lead. Like it felt very like she was in that element. Lifetime more so than hallmark. So hallmark leads tend to be um, the dairy aisle at the local IGA. Um, There's nothing really beyond cheese, but lifetime movies, again, more cheese, but stinky cheese because it's all just like extreme dr- extreme drama films and they just hype it up by getting actresses or actors to like cry and lament and mourn and weep and like really really bring out the cheese ball so it's like hallmark is like american standard or american cheese and then lifetime is like what like a blue blue, blue cheese che- a blue cheese <laughs> goat cheese feta cheese um, okay, and then one thing we'll talk about is a thing that we didn't really talk about that was confusing to me. Like, there are financial problems that they have with the medical bills, but they're, the dad is a, um, a guess. The dad is supposedly the, the only or the biggest veterinary doctor in the state of Texas that hosts all sorts of animals. Like farm animals. So, the biggest in the state, no, not just, yeah, farm animals. So, Texas. When you think of Texas, just think of the animals that you think about. Horses, oxen, cows, sheep, potentially, pigs. And if you're a specialist in that field and you're the biggest, you know, in the you know, most wide-ranging veterinary doctor. And one of the biggest states of the United States. Then there's no reason you should be devoid of money yeah. because you're, yeah, I mean, think about just Texas rodeos. Yep. Texas cattle ranches. They need to take their animals to a specific doctor. Yeah, and he had horses and all that stuff. There was a whole scene where he's going through stables checking on his horse patients. So it doesn't make sense that he's like devoid of cash. Yeah, they like go so broke that they're like living on credit cards. And I'm like, I mean, I don't know what was going on in the economy at this time. Maybe it was the recession. But even then, like, I don't know the last, like most doc- most veterinary visits are like for serious problems are between like two thousand and five thousand dollars for just one animal. I and know that's th- a cat or a dog. I know that horses are ex- are exceptionally expensive animals. Like I know that their care is very expensive. I don't know what a vet bill for a horse is like, but he had like eight. He had like eight under his care at one point. And I'm just thinking, I don't know. 
I don't know, guys. But hey, you know, I like I said, I don't know what the situation really was. Maybe that really happened. Maybe they really were like that was a, a legitimate part of the story. So I'm not going to really question it but a little bit of it was this felt a little hokey it felt like it was drama i guess i guess ever movie. since i saw social network and finding out that that was mostly made up i'm always suspicious from now on of movies that are based on a true story how much of it is based on a true story and how much did you make up to make me want to see the film okay well i think we finished our series the uh heaven series so Yay! We are officially finished with our first series of um, movies on a certain topic in the podcast. So, we are going to be moving on to... (laughs) Will is grimacing. Oh, he's grimacing. We are moving on to the God's Not Dead series! Um, If I have to hear that... If I have to hear that song one more time in my life, I'm not going to be a happy person. That song was overplayed from my time in high school through college. Who's the lead singer that sings that song? Michael Tate. He took over Newsboys from Peter Furler. I mean, like, you don't want to disappoint Michael Tate. Come on. He he, he puts his heart and soul into that song. Mm. God's not dead. He's surely alive. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the podcast <laughs> because if I have to hear that song one more time, I might not show up to next week's podcast. Uh, oh, a month next, next month i'm sorry podcast um we are doing the god's not dead series next uh, all four films i did not know there's four there are four um and we are having some guest speakers i know for sh- for certain we will have um two guest speakers for the first two podcasts super excited to have them on the show and uh we are going to be diving into the world of christian apologetics which i have some experience in and the people my guest speakers have uh some experience in or our guest speakers, because one will be with me and the other one will be with Will. So that'll be really cool. We'll have a little switcheroo. Will will be hosting the podcast uh, for that one. So that'll be exciting. Yes, you have something to say? I was going to say something funny, but the, uh, the, the the time for the joke is over. Okay. So that'll be, uh, I'm Hannah. I'm signing off. And that is? I'm here. Oh, I'm. am I really here? We need to watch something with like like deep philosophy where you're like, is any of this real? Oh my gosh, I am here now. Don't we? I'm prepared to watch all of his movies. We we cannot mention it here on the podcast because we would start a crazy train. But I'm will. I'm not going to use my uh, old podcast name that I had back in back in college. But I'm will. And I'm Hannah, and we're signing off for the Metamorphic Side Productions podcast. And we hope to see you next time. Bye.